special surprise. Please make some noise for your opener for tonight's show. Get loud. Let me hear you. Put those hands together for none other than Kenneth Mitchell. so blessed to have wonderful friends and caregivers to get me around. Thank you. ALS has definitely presented, ALS has definitely presented many challenges. Not being able to move your limbs really sucks. The other day I was wearing a horgon around my neck, and someone came up to me and asked if I was looking for love. I said no. I was just looking for someone to trim my pubic hair. <laughs> welcome, welcome everyone to Comedy Night. I am so honored to be here. I simply feel alive. Welcome, welcome everyone to... I simply love to laugh. It's been a real coping tool in dealing with my terminal illness especially the darker humor among my friends. For example, I just got a birthday card from Jason Isaacs which read, Happy birthday, mate. I hope you enjoy it, because it's probably your last. <laughs> God, I love him. <laughs> Please sit back and laugh with me at the absurd. But I ask that you please don't heckle. Mainly because it takes me ten friggin' minutes to type a response to <laughs> the Although, I do have some pre-recorded phrases if you want to try some out. How about you, in the pink, in the front row? Just yell something out. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> and you in the back row in the red, give it to me. Last one. You in the second row, in the green. Just yell something out. the second row, I have to admit I was planning on coming out here and doing this whole bit where my penis does a monologue. I even went as far to reach out to Jason Isaacs and ask him if he would voice my penis. And in true Jason form, he wrote back, sorry mate, I don't want to be typecast as a dick. <laughs> I know right. I think it is a little late for that, Jason. <laughs> What's even better, 
is at the bottom of the email was a PS. Also, Ken, I don't play tiny parts. Oh. <laughs> Part of the reason I love being at Star Trek conventions is being surrounded by some of the world's greatest scientific minds. An honor. And I come here tonight to share with you my new cutting-edge findings from my journey with ALS. That I have just finally, finally proven the scientific theory. If you don't use it, you lose it. <laughs> Last one. You in the... That's right, folks, ALS has not been kind to my penis. It's an unfortunate problem when your penis shorter than your pubic hair. It's like a grain of sticky rice in a bed of tribbles. <laughs> Dr. Aaron McDonald and Dr. Mohammed Nur have officially labeled my penis an anomaly. <laughs> I still get boners though, which can be a problem in the shower with your caregiver. A little embarrassing. So I think of my dead grandmother a lot. <laughs> the problem is, other sexy shit pops into my mind to counteract production. I'll be like, dead grandmother, dead grandmother, dead grandmother, Borg queen. <laughs> Dead grandmother, dead grandmother, dead grandmother. Seven of nine. Seven of nine. Wish it. Dead grandmother, dead grandmother, dead grandmother. Tribbles. Wish it. Oh, come on. The like you haven't rubbed your nipples with one before. <laughs> And not just regular piss. I wait until after my high concentrated B12 shot. Some, I spend a lot of, oh, come on, oh, come on. The IQ haven't run. I spend a lot of time with my main caregiver, Hendrik. So much so, I can always tell when he is mad at me. He wipes my ass extra hard with the rough toilet paper. I know, not cool. It's okay though, I get him back. I piss on him. <laughs> and not just regular piss. I wait until after my high concentrated B12 shot. Some chemical reaction makes my piss a deep purple, then I piss all over his white shirt. <laughs> That's right. Don't fuck with me. God. I love science. <laughs> Speaking of science, it is wild that I have a machine that follows my retinas and allows me to communicate with you. Very grateful. But can someone please do something about predictive text? I finally got to see my mom after two years of the pandemic. As you can imagine, it was an emotional reunion of a mother finally hugging her terminally ill son. After the most loving embrace, through many tears, my mom asked if she could get me anything. I turned to my new communication device to type out with my eyes the words, eating, time. My mom was eagerly watching the glory of science and technology, witnessing me type with my eyes for the first time, glued to the screen. The problem is my kids and friends love programming and rude messages into my device. So as I'm writing the word, eat, the predictive text says, eat shit and die you stupid cunt face. <laughs> now, I grew up in this, the other day my son happened now. 
I grew up in the 70s, so before I had a chance to erase it, my mom is shoving a bar of Irish Spring in my mouth. I'm not pretty, I'm an ALS patient. I'm pretty sure that is abuse, but I deserved it. Thank you, Simons. <laughs> I have an amazing network of family and friends. I have loads of support that I am forever grateful for. When I got diagnosed with ALS on August 13th, 2018, on August 19th, four of my best friends flew in from Canada and showed up on my front porch. Three of them are here with me on this cruise. Jeff Park, Parky, JJ O'Brien, Dr. Alastair Goodwill or LG for short. The fourth friend was Dr. Ryan Foster. We just call him Foster. Now these friends have been instrumental in my journey and I can't love them or thank them enough for their unconditional support. Here they were ready to help and support my family any way they could during this devastating time. Dr. Foster was incredibly helpful to answer our medical questions. And there were lots as you can imagine. Parky, who runs a year-round educational and outdoor camp for children, was extremely helpful with morale and keeping our own kids occupied and distracted. Then we had JJ, who is a real estate and financial guru. We were panicking about our financial future and he was able to put many stresses aside by combing through our financials, even doing things like reading the life insurance policy cover to cover. Having these trusted friends was a huge comfort. And that leaves Al G. Dr. Goodwill. He is a professor of forensic psychology, specializing in serial killer profiling. <laughs> Even more specific, he deals with cases of a sexual nature. Yes, basically, he is Dexter. <laughs> I'm pretty certain Alastair showed up at our door to murder me and my family. In <laughs> some fucked up way, he ended up being the most helpful. You see, instead of feeling the complete devastation of my fresh ALS diagnosis, I was more worried Dexter was going to club my ankles in my sleep and screw me up the butt with a butcher knife. <laughs> It was a thrill to perform tonight. I am grateful for Garrett allowing me to roll on stage and open for him. Back in 2021, I had approached him about wanting to open for him. That doing some stand-up was one of the final things left on my bucket list. He welcomed me with open arms and has been a loyal, supportive friend. Grateful for his friendship. The only difference between Garrett and I is that Jason Isaacs was this close to playing my penis. Just funny as shit. <laughs> awesome, awesome job, Kenneth Mitchell. I met a lot of people today. I ran into a lot of you. By the way, how many of you went to the rave last night? <laughs> Listen to that. And a lot of people said to me, I am struggling because of the rave last night. <laughs> Hopefully you feel better right now. All right, folks, thank you so much. Kenneth, great job. We're going to keep the show going. Please make some noise.
Boys continuing on the show. Get loud, everybody, and welcome to the stage, Mr. Garrett Wong. Hello. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. How am I supposed to follow that? <laughs> Thanks, Kenneth Mitchell. You're a pal. You know who I feel really bad about? Megan, my, uh, my lady, was talking to some fans earlier today, and they were saying that we don't like stand-up comedy that has cussing in it. And then, you know, Megan was oh, don't worry, Garrett doesn't cuss in his show. But Kenneth Mitchell does. <laughs> And JT did, so everyone else, but, so maybe that gives me license to cuss, so sorry couple who came here and heard a lot of F-bombs, we apologize, I'm so sad, yes. Okay, first of all, I want to say congratulations to Aaron, are you there? <laughs> Dr. Aaron and A.A. Ron, as I call him, it's the only way to differentiate between the two Aarons, A.A. Ron and Dr. Aaron, yes, he proposed to her, and she said yes. So congratulations to Aaron, A.A. Ron, and I only have two words for Dr. Aaron McDonald, and that is, suck it! <laughs> okay, the people who were not here in 2020 said, how rude of Garrett. He just congratulated them. See, this is in a reference to what happened in the 2020 cruise. On the 2020 cruise, we were sitting in the dining area, and Kenneth Mitchell was part of this. He's sitting down, and he's like, hey, Garrett! I'm like, what? He goes, our scientists are better than your scientists. So he was sitting at a table with Dr. Aaron. I was sitting at a table with Dr. Noor. So I had Dr. Muhammad Noor. Dr. Aaron McDonald was with Kenneth Mitchell. And that's when he said, our scientists are better than yours. And I said, yeah, food fight. Like, you know, we're pretending to, to do this. And as we're leaving the dining place, Dr. Aaron McDonald looks at me. He's like, yo, suck it. Like that. And so, Get you right back. <laughs> I want to dedicate this show to uh, a lady who last year, I don't know which performance you came to, but for those of you who came out, but one of the performances, um, I had to call out my uh, friend Aaron's roommate, who basically was not a Trek fan, but she was there because her parents were also on that trip. And so that roommate's name was Wendy. I called her out, made fun of her, but uh, I want to dedicate this show to her mother, Julie, who passed away earlier this year. So, yes, so this is a show dedicated to Julie, who was a huge Star Trek fan, loved the Harry Kim character, and uh, unfortunately succumbed to COVID, so I just want to make that, you know, yeah, this dedication. I know, I'm bumming everything out right now, but thank you so much, and thank you to Wendy is here, and Mark, her father, is also here, so... Yeah. Lots of stuff has happened. Lots of stuff has happened since 2020 March, when we were last here. COVID, first of all, of course, that's a huge thing. TikTok has happened. <laughs> I have a 13-year-old stepdaughter, and like, you know, and it, and when TikTok first came out, like, no matter where she was in the house, it was just like doing stuff, like, like this, like, and, and all kinds of moves, you know, ooh, ah, ooh, yeah. It's just like, what is this? <laughs> And then I got into watching TikTok, and it's funny because TikTok is just little tiny little bites, little tiny little bites of entertainment that you keep scrolling through. You start scrolling at 8 p.m., next thing you know, it's three in the morning. And you're like, what the, like five hours. And the funny thing is, there's a weird algorithm on TikTok. It knows when you've been scrolling too long because there will be one video that comes up is like, you've been on TikTok way too long. Like, like one guy says that. And that's when I turn off the phone. I'm like, okay, I'm done with that. I'm not going to continue with that. Um, I think that I would like to see house lights. Can we go up real quick? Thank you. All right. I just want to see for show of hands who has never been to a stand up show for, that I've done. First time stand up show. Ooh. Okay. And for all of you who are here in 2020 at one of my comedy shows, I want to hear your best. George Decay, oh my, on three, okay? One, two, three. Oh my! I should have called the Guinness Book of World Records <laughs> and told them, we are gonna break the record of the most George Decay impersonations on a cruise ship. 
in unison at the same time. The other thing that's happened since 2020, I had surgery. So if anyone sees this scar on my neck, this is where they went in to repair my bulging disc between my C4 and C5. A lot of people don't know this, but when I was doing my stand-up show in 2020, I stayed on the, on the stool for the most part. And I did that because if I was walking around, there was a good chance that I would have collapsed because, yeah, that was not good. So the surgery happened, I'm recuperating, so it's good. My nerves are coming back, I can feel my hands. Yes. Do you guys remember the Voyager photo op? The Voyager photo op was hours. And so there were four seats in front, and I sat down in front, not telling my fellow Star Trek Voyager co-stars that I was dealing with this neck issue and that I postponed the surgery to come on the cruise. So I'm sitting down, and all of a sudden, Ethan Phillips shows up, and everyone looks at me and like, really? You're gonna make Ethan stand? Get up, Garrett. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll get up. <laughs> so I stood there and went through all the photos. A couple times I almost passed out, but I, I held, I held. You know what this tells you? The dedication that I have for you guys. <laughs> Some, some of the funniest moments came from that cruise. I remember during that photo shoot, Jerry Ryan tried to give some hand sanitizer to Kate, and when she squeezed it, the whole top flew off, and this huge gob of hand sanitizer lands on Kate's leg. And I remember it was just like slow motion. Like Kate was like, and Jerry was like, it's like a standoff. Like all the Voyager actors like, what's gonna happen? This is gonna be a Janeway 7 confrontation. What's gonna happen? They did laugh, so then we all laughed. It was like, okay, it's funny, we can laugh. <laughs> uh, what's happening on that thing? Oh, this is, the, this is the second show. So this is the red card show, right? The red card show. And you got the blue card show. Red card, blue. Every time I see red and blue you know, classifications, I always think, after living in Los Angeles for such a long time, I think about Los Angeles gangs. I think about Crips, blue, bloods, red. Which then reminds me of the time that I went to audition for a USC student film. Now, when I was starting out acting, you could look in the drama log in the back and you could audition for UCLA student films in Westwood Village. Westwood Village is close to Bel Air, Beverly Hills, really nice parts of Los Angeles. USC is located in the armpit of Los Angeles. <laughs> Not the best place to go. So the audition I had was for like a, sort of like a tough guy, whatever. So I'm at home preparing, thinking, all right, I gotta get the right wardrobe. So I found a bandana and I put the bandana on it. Yes, you know where this is going. So I have my script, I'm looking at my, I park my car in South Central Los Angeles. I get out, I read my script with my blue freaking bandana on. And as I'm reading the script going, okay, I gotta get memorize this. I'm walking along the sidewalk and I notice that there are two pairs of shoes standing blocking my way with red shoelaces. And I follow up, and it's two teenage girls that are bloods, they're in the gang, right? And they're looking at me, they go, you a crit? And I go, what, 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 oh! And then I'd have the realization, oh my God, you idiot, blue slob, oh, no, 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 no! And I quickly rip this off, I go, I'm an actor! <laughs> I don't care about this color. I throw it down, look, if I was really a crip, would I do this? <laughs> I'm like, would I tap dance on it? Look what I can do. <laughs> my, my life flashed before all my eyes. I thought, I'm gonna be shot by a 13-year-old gang member right now, going to an audition. So that uh, is what the red card makes me think about. So thank you for that trauma. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, Robert Beltran, Chicote, he had a little dramatic situation. He was, uh, we were filming really late one night, which we did on Voyager all the time. So, he was driving back home, he lives in Los Feliz, and he comes up to this stoplight, and it's two or three in the morning, and another car, like a, uh, I don't even know what model car it was, but it comes up very slowly next to him at the light, and he looks over, and there's, it's full of these, kind of these Mexican gangbangers, right? They've got, they're sitting there, and they're looking, and they look at him, and they start talking, and Beltran's sitting there going, oh no. Oh no, this, there's gonna be an altercation. Something's gonna happen, what am I gonna do? And he's trying to think fast on his feet and all of a sudden, you, they wind down the window and the lead gangbanger guy goes, hey, 
hey, mira, mira, look, it's the commander. <laughs> so Beltran went from like, Ooh, I'm sweating to, oh yeah, I'm the commander. <laughs> Their car starts bouncing, you know, Beltran's bouncing with them. <laughs> Thanks for watching Voyager. <laughs> Drives off. <sighs> that did happen, it's for real. Uh, <laughs> uh, you guys remember the episode Prime Factors from Voyager? Prime Factors? That's when we went down to the, the planet Sakaris. That was like the, the rise of the Delta Quadrant. Um, so we're down there. Well, before we start filming, we have to wear non-Starfleet uniforms. It's like um, they had to give us like our R&R &R outfit. And so I had told them when I first booked the role on Voyager, I said, listen, I'm really, really really um, nervous about how you're going to portray Harry Kim. I said, don't make it overtly Asian, you know? I said, don't make me walk into, um, let's say we walk up to a replicator in the mess hall. Don't make Harry say, bowl of kimchi, please, you know, or talk, you know, fried rice, whatever. I said, please talk to me about anything, because I just, I'm very sensitive about that. So this episode, I had to wear this outfit, and they said, the top kind of folds over, kind of looks like a possibly like an Asian garment. Maybe you want to come down to wardrobe and take a look at it. I said, yeah, I'll do that. So I went down there and I looked at it. And I said, you know what? It's got pattern on it. And so, and there's a lot of other things going on. It doesn't really look overtly Asian, but thank you for thinking about me. And then they said, yeah, this, this top was already worn by someone on Star Trek. And I said, oh, and so it's a repurposed garment? They go, yeah. I said, who wore this? I said, Patrick Stewart. And I went, oh, I will wear this as a diaper, as a turban, as an armband, as a jump strap. However you want me to wear this, I will wear this. So I'm a huge Patrick Stewart fan, so I was so excited. You know, that made it okay. They could have brought a gong out. I mean, that's fine. It's fine. This gong was used by Patrick Stewart. Yeah. Gong. That made me so happy. Oh my goodness, the opening ceremony. What a cr did I just drop my notes? <laughs> this stage is haunted. <laughs> Wing it. Wing it. <laughs> no, sir, I will not. <laughs> I just sound like Bill Clinton just then. No, sir, I will not. <laughs> For some reason, he turned into Bill Clinton. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I was actually, I was asked to, to introduce President Clinton at the Congressional Asian American Caucus in uh, Washington, D.C. So I was the MC, and what was so cool was I, I introduced the president, and then I went backstage, and then I was hanging with the Secret Service guys. I was like, hey, I'm going to try to imitate the president for the president after his speech. And they were like, okay. So then I was help. they were helping me. So I was sitting there doing my accent, and they're like, mm, slow it down a little bit, you know. Mm, add a little bit of this. So the Secret Service guys helped me. After his 17-page speech, he comes backstage to meet everybody, you know, and I said, Mr. President? He's like, yeah. I said, I'd love to do my presentation for you. My presentation of you, for you. And he's like, all right, go ahead. So I said, mm. I remember growing up in Arkansas. My grandfather took me fishing. So I started doing the whole thing, and, and he was like, oh, nice. He applauded. And, wasn't amused, really. He was. <laughs> yeah, but it was fun for me. Um, <laughs> oh my goodness! My very first trip to Beijing, China. I went there in 2008 with my parents in this winter time, and we went to go visit the Great Wall. The Great Wall of China is an amazing, amazing accomplishment. And one thing I noticed when I was at the Great Wall was that everyone at the Great Wall, every single tourist, was Chinese. Like they, what, there were no Europeans, there were no Americans, there was just Chinese tourists. And I, I said, Mom, this is crazy. Like, there's nobody but Chinese. And she goes, yeah, yeah. And she didn't think much of it. So I went away, I walked away from my mom and dad, and I walked toward a guard turret. And I, when I got to the guard turret, I started hearing English. But, oh my gosh. There's some English speakers here. And lo and behold, out from the guard turret comes Sean White, Olympic gold medaler, Sean White. 
and his posse, right? And they're all laughing, they're talking, and I'm like, Sean White? He was like, hey man, what's up? So we start talking. Now, this is when my mom comes up. I go, mom, mom, this is an Olympic gold medalist, Sean White. He's the only English speaker on the Great Wall today, him and his friends. And my mom's like, huh, okay. And my mom doesn't even say anything else except for, you know, my son's famous too. <laughs> Isn't that every mom in the world who's like, <laughs> we don't give a crap about your kid. My son's famous too. Have you ever heard of Star Trek? <laughs> Sean White's like, uh, uh, why am I getting jumped by this woman? I mean, literally, verbally jumped by my mom, and it was so embarrassing. It was like, mom, why did you come to school? Stay home. It was just not good. I was so upset. So upset. <laughs> um, opening ceremonies. Okay, so opening ceremonies. I loved opening ceremonies. Why? Because crazy stuff happened. The person who got injured during Denise Crosby's introduction. And I was backstage and I said, Denise Crosby killed a fan. Denise Crosby killed a fan. <laughs> she did it, you know? And I could look over at Mary Chifo. Mary Chifo was the person who was introduced right before Denise. And Mary's just like, whew, thank God it wasn't me on stage. <laughs> oh God, whew, thank God it was Denise. Let her handle that stuff. That fan was okay. But then another fan fell on the side. Do you remember that? That was crazy too. And, but I love all the moves that people had. Like Denise Crosby came out, she did, she did this. So, th so this, I'm just gonna start calling Natasha Yar. Okay, that was her little thing. <laughs> Terry Farrell, she did this. That's called the Dax. These are dance moves that you can use at the dances, you know, that are left on the ship. So we've got, what's this? Tasha Yar. Yeah. Now I also had some fans after my show in 2020 that came up with a dance move that they called the Delancey. Looks kind of like this. There's some of you in this room that have no idea what this is. After the show, ask a friend. <laughs> Walter came out. I love Walter. Walter did some little twirl, twirl on stage, and then he ended with... So this is, this is the Chekhov. What's this? Yes. <laughs> the Chekhov. Oh, and Bob O'Reilly gets on stage. When he started chanting Kapla in Klingon, and everyone was chanting with him, oh, like, I mean, I was getting goosebumps. I mean, I was just, I was feeling Klingon. I just wanted, at that point, I wanted our cruise ship to ram another cruise ship. <laughs> Speed, take out the carnival cruise line. I can't open my eyes as big as him, but this is Galron. Galron approves! Can you imagine that? People are like, yeah, we were right, we were ready to go on our cruise, and that Royal Caribbean rammed us. All we heard was like the entire ship was chanting something like kapa, kapla, kapa, kapa, and then everything went dark. Oh my god. I believe everything happens for a reason. I believe everything happens for a reason. And before the cruise even started, I was at Universal Studios on the Friday before we uh, uh, embarked on Saturday. So I'm at Universal and I'm in line at the burger place to get my plant-based burger. And uh, <laughs> I'm standing there and this woman in the line in front of me has a tattoo on her arm. And it says, the Lancy. I'm like, no. <laughs> I can't be right. But then I started thinking, everything happens for a reason. And I feel like, you know, we had such a long break before 2022 that the power of Delancey was calling to me. <laughs> and these signs, these signs, a tattoo. And on the Nassau, the Nassau excursion, we were on a street which was Delancey Street in the Bahamas. So I kept, I kept thinking the church of Delancey has to go on, you know? Yeah. Good old Delancey. <laughs> so the week before the cruise, actually, I was at a rented house in Davenport, Florida, with uh, members of the Guac and Fries uh, group. That we, we, oh, yeah, the Guac and Fries right here. 
So a big group of us rented this house. We had a lot of fun, and um, there was like a, I guess it would be a projection TV thing, and, and one of the guys had his laptop screen, and it, we could see everything on screen, and one of my friends, Billy, turns to me, he's like, this is the best. I love looking at people's like tabs and their internet search history. <laughs> so we're looking at stuff, and we see, I see, <laughs> There's like a couple of things up there that are questionable, right? So I'm looking at that, and one says thick and creamy, and it's just like, you don't know what the rest is. And so oh, I'm like, what the? And then I go, Cam, what is this, some, some porn search? And he goes, no, 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 guys, it's mostly food. So he enlarges the tab, and it was like, thick and creamy tomato soup, is what it was. Like, oh. Then there was Asian, and Asians, and Asian. I go, oh, Asian fetish, okay, what's going on here? And then he enlarges it as Asians and Asians in America. Where do they like to go and go to online Asian food groceries? So it was, again, food stuff. So everything on there was not really sexual. So it was kind of a, was kind of a joke. Um, Ma Megan was actually backstage in the, in the pool area. Backstage. <laughs> Backyard. This is when you don't have enough sleep on the cruise ship. You start saying things that make no sense. The backyard in the pool, and her and Keely were there, and they saw like a plane that was writing letters in the air. And it was like, I, and it was love, and then the first letter of the name was J. And they're like, oh my God, it's a proposal, it's a proposal, someone's getting married. J, and they were, you know, they were guessing. Is it Jacqueline? Is it, and then the next letter was E. Like, oh my gosh, it's Jessica, it's Jenny. And then it was S, oh, it's definitely Jessica. And then it was U and S. So it was I love Jesus. It was not a proposal. Then the skywriter wrote a little bit more. God plus U equals smiley face. So that was... <laughs> we all thought it was a proposal, which would have been way, way cuter, of course. Um, oh, and I forgot. The other dance move um, from opening ceremonies is going to be the Culber, as in Wilson Cruz. Because you saw all the moves that we had. When Wilson came down, he did this. He's like... He did like the rocket kick, because he's from New York, right? So he went right like that. So anyone that does a kick up, that is the Colbert. So we have that one. I love Wilson. Is Wilson here? No. <laughs> uh, I had this jacket on in um, England for the first time, and we were both at that convention. And when you buy new jackets, the, the vents in back are actually sewn together. You're supposed to cut that thread. And I walked past him. He's like, Garrett, Garrett, come here. I'm like, what? I would not be a good gay friend if I did not tell you to take care of this. And so I'm like, oh my God. So he cut the little cords for me. So thank you, gay friend. Appreciate it. <laughs> You're the best. Okay. Love Wilson Cruz. So awesome. Um, oh, I'm going to do an impersonation for you. I think you guys all have heard this so far throughout the week. Here we go. Doors closing. <laughs> Doors opening. Going up. Deck eight. Deck nine. You've all heard that, female British voice in the elevators. ECB and the Star Trek crews really missed out on an opportunity here. <laughs> that voice should be recorded from whoever the captain of the cruise is. So this year, it's George Decay. So it should have been, doors opening. <laughs> doors closing. Deck eight. Deck nine. And if you hit the highest deck, oh my. Before we boarded the cruise, we were sitting in that little area where all the actors are sitting before before we get on the ship, and uh, Max Gredenchik was there. So last year, Megan had shown me a video clip of the Rat Pack singing, and one of the lyrics to one of the songs ends with, and Garrett Wong is gay, like that. And I was like, what? So I confronted Max about this. I go, Max, I saw a clip of your Rat Pack performance, and you... You guys, I don't know if it was Casey or you, but you guys have a lyric, Scaragon is gay, what's up with that? He's like, you saw that? <laughs> I mean, he turned, he literally turned into Rom. He's like, uh,
That's right, Max, I can get you back too. <laughs> it's not just you. Okay. Oh, uh, my goodness. I know. <laughs> okay, so the excursions. The first excursion I did was the Nassau Sights and Flavors one. So, yeah. Yeah. So you, you meet down, at, it was 8 in the morning. We had to meet down in Studio B. We come in there, scan our card, and they're like, oh, okay, you're group 45. A little sticker. Put a little sticker on your chest, 45. Now, there are two groups doing the exact same excursion. One was 45, one was 28. 45 was led by myself. Group 28 was led by Wilson Cruz, actually. Yeah, so Wilson and I are sitting in, sitting in the chairs. He's right behind me, and we're talking. And I mentioned how funny it was that, that Anthony Rapp, during the opening ceremonies, you know, you know, he said, hello. And then he made that total random statement. He goes, I will be wearing sunblock. And that was it. It didn't attach to anything else, you know. I mean, it could have been anything. Today I will eat a tuna sandwich. <laughs> Thank you. You know. <laughs> so, and then, and then Wilson talked about how he needs the sunblock because of how fair complected he is, right? And he said, he said, Anthony is so white. We actually use him as like a bounce card for light. We bounce the light off of him when we're filming Discovery. And I said, what? And I didn't know if he was joking or not. And then, then Wilson goes, Honey, I love scenes with Anthony. I look glamorous. You know? I mean, to use another actor's face as a bounce card is just beyond me. I just did. Oh my gosh. Anthony, if you're here, I'm sorry. Don't get mad at me. Don't get mad at me. Uh, do you guys remember the uh, announcement ceremony for all the guests for next year? They had that on the main, you know, promenade thing. <laughs> so I'm standing there with Megan and our friend Billy, who's Asian American. He's standing there too, and I've got my mask on and a baseball cap. Billy has a mask on and a baseball cap, and this fan walks up, and he looks at Billy, and he looks at me, and he looks at Billy, and he looks at me. And he turns to Billy and says, Garrett. <laughs> Do you have any insider info on who the guests are gonna be for next year? And Billy doesn't say like, I'm, I'm just Billy, that's Garrett. He pretends to be me. Okay? He, he looks at the fan, he's like, no, I don't think I can tell you, you know. <laughs> Secret information, you're gonna have to wait, be patient. And then, then I start talking to the fan, he still has no idea, he still thinks Billy is me. I've been doing this thing where I see fans that have um, dry erase boards outside their, their door. I'll sign it, I'll say, you know, Harry Kim was here, and then I'll sign my name on there. Now, Billy knows about this, so he's been going around and pretending to be me <laughs> and signing other people's doors. So if you're on the sixth floor and you have a signature thinking it's me, it, it's not, it's Billy. It's Billy. No, it's, it's, What's it's that? Not. Now I gotta go to the six, but yeah, but when I sign it, they're gonna, that's not him, erase. <laughs> don't believe that's him. Oh my God. Um, my mom was born in China. She was raised in Taiwan. So her command of the English language, it's good, it's good. Her pronunciation is good, but she gets some things jumbled up every now and then. My sister is huge into CrossFit, so she does that a lot. And I remember my mom going, I, I said, where's Laura at? She goes, oh, she's at Crossword. And I was like, what? <laughs> Early in my career when I was, before Voyager happened, it's just a struggling actor. My mom had watched uh, Oprah and she was like, you know, you should follow the advice of Whoopi Gopher. <laughs> I said, Whoopi Gopher? She's like, yes, she was on Oprah. She talked about how when she was acting, she would go to any audition. If the audition called for a middle-aged white man, she'd go for that too. She'd walk in and say, I can play a middle-aged white man. So this is what Whoopi Gopher said. And I told my mom, I had to break it to her slowly and gently. It's Whoopi Goldberg, mom. Not Gopher, so Whoopi Gopher and crossword. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, here's a good story. <laughs> so, before I got, uh, before I left, I, I eventually moved out of Los Angeles, but when I was living there filming Voyager, I used to hang out, um, I used to go to nightclubs in the LA area, 
And I knew this one kid who was sort of a club kid, like a promoter. At least that was his side job. Music was his main job because he ended up being in a band called Crazy Town. And they sang a song called Butterfly. It was increased to number one. Yeah. Shifty Shell Shock was his like stage name. But I knew him as Seth, Seth Binzer. So Seth called me up one night. He's like, hey, hey man, um, I'm going to a new gentleman's, a new gentle, secret gentleman's club. I'm like, what? Why is it secret? It's run by the Hells Angels. I was like, oh, okay. So we drive, we drive to this warehouse district in Los Angeles. It's just all warehouses. You know? Nothing. I'm like, this is it? He's like, yeah, man, we gotta go through this fence first. It's like a hole in the fence. <laughs> go through that. Go around the one warehouse building and around another one to a random door, nondescript, no signs. He bangs on it three times, psh, opens up, password. There's a password. So we gave the password. We walk in and this place is done up. I mean, there's a mezzanine area, hardwood accents, floor, I mean, it's just beautiful. The Hells Angels knew how, they, they knew how to interior design. It was amazing. So they had good interior design skills. And um, so we sat in the mezzanine. And what's crazy is I turned to Seth and I said, there are no Hells Angels here to, at all. I don't see anybody that works for the Hells Angels, or is part of the Hells Angels group. And sure enough, not a, not a trace, until something happened on the main floor. A dancer came out and I noticed Scotty Kahn from Hawaii Five-O. James Kahn's son was down there with his party. And one of his friends thought it would be funny to, type, to take a beer bottle and try to, yeah, put it where the sun don't shine. The minute that happened and the, 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 uh, the dancer just slapped the hand away um, and was offended, all of a sudden, walls opened up, okay? <laughs> Boom. Boom, boom, five, heart, five Hells Angels came out of this wall. There was like a, I don't know what, I mean, it just, all these things opened up, like walls, counters, you know, drawers, they were all popping out of drawers and stuff, you know? And they had clubs and chains, and they beat down Scotty Khan and his friends, and I, I applauded. I was like, you know, you guys are jerks. Beat him up, beat up Scotty Khan. Yeah, so they beat him up, they kicked him out. Um, but before this, when we were sitting in the mezzanine, one really, Big guy. There's two big guys that were sitting at a table near the front rail, and they were the only two that kind of looked like Hell's Angels. Everyone else that was that were patrons, they were just normal people, they're everyday people. And so I'd been seeing these people for a while. So then after the whole beatdown of Scotty Khan and his friends happened, the biggest guy, you know, who had been looking back at our table a lot, and I told Seth, I go, I don't know if what's happening, but this the big guy over there staring at us, and Seth's like, yeah. That's crazy. So this goes on for a while. Scotty Khan incident happens. Scotty Khan gets kicked out. Now big guy gets up and starts walking towards our table. I'm like, oh no, oh no, what's gonna happen? Oh my God, we're in the Hells Angels strip club and we don't even, nobody even knows we're here. It's not even legal. We're gonna die. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be able to film the episode of Voyager on Monday. And so <laughs> the guy comes up to the table and he goes, I gotta show you something. I'm like, what? <laughs> and he reaches behind his, I thought he was pulling out a gun or whatever. Well, he was pulling off his shirt. He turns around and it's a huge Klingon insignia tattoo <laughs> on his back. And he's like, you like it? <laughs> oh, thank God, I love it, yeah. I thought you were gonna kill us, okay. <laughs> so even in random secret gentlemen's clubs, you meet Star Trek fans. <laughs> So random. Someone goes, we're everywhere! Oh. <laughs> uh, oh, so the Nassau excursion, group 45 and group 28. Yeah, 45. Well, it's funny because it, there, <laughs> group 28 was with Wilson, group 45 was with me. There was a couple sitting in Studio B off to the side that happened to be in group 28. But they saw Wilson sitting behind me and they're like, oh my God, Wilson, remember us from the other day? We want to be in your group and we want to switch to 28. And I actually had a couple of friends that are fans that were in 28 and wanted to switch to 45. So I thought, hey, I'll be the broker for this. So I get up out of my seat and I walk on down to the couple and they were from Branford, Ontario, Canadian couple. Yeah. 
Canadian Chinese, actually. So it was Mike Chow and his wife, Jean Tian, different last names. So I go up to Mike and I'm like, oh, hey, so you guys want to switch to our group like that? And he's like, well, yeah, we're thinking about it. And I look at the wife and she's just like, <laughs> and now she realizes it's me, right? So she's just like in a trance. And I said, so you met, um, you met Wilson, right? The other day, she says, uh-huh. I said, did you talk to him? Uh-huh. I go, was he nice? Uh-huh. What did he say? I don't know. <laughs> so you want to switch to his group? Mm-mm. <laughs> Staying in your group. Harry Kim's my favorite. <laughs> Didn't know you were here. From that point forward, she was like my shadow. Like everywhere we went on the excursion, she felt she was within two or three paces behind. You know, just but this isn't an old China. You don't have to stand over there. Just walk to where you need to walk, right? So we went to the first place. I had some street vendors. I had a hat on, like this hat to keep off the sun. After we left there, all of a sudden, she had bought the almost the exact same hat for her husband. He's wearing one, and she's got one that looks like mine too. I'm like, oh my god, they're copying me too. Like everything. Everything. And what was even funnier was every place we stopped at, she would completely, I mean, she would lose Mike. You know, she'd walk up, she's, I lost my husband again. <laughs> and she's still staring at me. Like, and I go, are you okay with that? Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> just, just stay within my sight, though. I like Harry Kim. <laughs> We are outside the chocolate store, and Mike Chow pulls out of his backpack a couple of chocolate-covered croissants that he had taken from the ship beforehand. And I said, how Asian of you <laughs> to not have to spend money off the ship to bring something out there. So he gave one croissant to his wife, Jean Tin, the huge Harry Kim fan, and one was for himself. Well, I started walking the store, and of course, just like a zombie, Jean followed me in with the croissant, you know. <laughs> I go over to get a sample of chocolate to eat it. She picks off at the same pile. She's it. <laughs> then I start looking at some other stuff and I lose track of her. And then all of a sudden, I come around a corner and she's in a corner of the store and she's just eating the croissants in the store. Like typically, that's rude, right? You're not gonna go to another business and start eating other food that from somewhere else. But she didn't wanna lose sight of me. So she's like, um, and she thought if she stood really still in the corner, none of the employees of the store would notice she was eating a croissant from outside. So when I saw her, she was like, and we locked eyes and we just started laughing. <laughs> I'm like, are you just trying to be invisible? Like, I'm invisible, I'm invisible. Nobody can see me. I'm gonna eat my croissant right here in the corner. Oh, it was so embarrassing. It, really was. it was, it was scary. Um, she, uh, no, but she was cute. It was really cute. What? Is she up there? Hey, she's up there, Jean Tian. I would have expected you would have been backstage, actually. Just like. Is he done with the set yet? Is he done? I have chocolates. Is he, is he done? Okay. Um, <laughs> what? I know you're still staring at me. <laughs> this is just never going to end, is it? You're just going to stare at me until the end of time. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm just trying to remember, what, what else did we do with that? Okay, so chocolate factory, the... Oh, we were at the rum factory, right? The rum factory, the chocolate factory, uh, rum cakes, yeah, yeah, that was, oh, by the way, on that tour, I noticed there was one pattern. Every stop that we went to that had the possibility of purchasing an item, it was always a really long stay. Like the tour guide was like, okay, so we're at the rum cake factory and there's a lot of things. If you buy four rum cakes, they'll give you a shot of rum. And so he knew the whole pitch sale for these people. So. And of course, we're gonna spend 25 minutes here back in the van when you're done. So that was that place. Then we went to another place. This will be 30 minutes here. You can purchase some goods here. Come back in 30, 30 minutes. And then the only stop we had that had no vendors was the beach, right? And he goes, okay, now we have the beautiful Nassau Beach. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's 1.58 right now. See you back on the bus by 2 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> Water, water, water. Okay, back up, back up, back up, back up. Ah, one shell. Okay. 
my two-minute memory of the Nassau Beach one shell. So sad. <laughs> Not cool. Oh my god. See, the biggest problem is I have so much material, I have to take stuff out. It's like, oh, it's just killing me so much. Um, the other people on the trip, I want to sh shout out to the Fort Worth, Texas family. Nancy, Tony, Michelle, and Matthew. There was also Extreme, uh, Eric Extreme and Kristen. And I'm like, man. Eh. And I was like, that's your last name? He's like, well, not my li but I changed it legally. Eric Extreme. I go, ah, that's cool. Maybe I should do that. So I started thinking of adjectives that began with G, you know. Garrett, uh, what was it? Anyone can anyone come up with something with a G, a G adjective? Gay. I like gorgeous. Okay, I'll take that. Gracious. Gracious. That's Garrett Gracious. Yeah. Yeah. He said Gra Garrett Grandeur. I was like, eh, not so much. Can we do this on your own time later? I asked for like one suggestion. They'd be like, let's go through everything. Okay. And then we had um, uh, Steve. Uh, we had, oh, wait a minute. We had Carl from Central California in Group 45. And we also had um, Tyler. Tyler from, uh, I don't remember where Tyler was from, but Tyler, you're out there. And of course, Steve from Ireland. I'm like, you're from Ireland. He's like, no, yeah, from Ireland. I said, was it tough getting out of Ireland? He was like, well, it was a, they're a little suspicious of me, the Irish customs. I'm like, oh, so he comes up and they're like, so you're going on a cruise by yourself. And he's like, yep. Hmm. Let me ask you a few more questions. Why are you going on this cruise by yourself? And it's the, actually tell me what this, what is this cruise that you're going on? And then he goes, the Star Trek cruise. And he's like, Oh, so you couldn't find anyone to go with you, could you? No. <laughs> Horrible! Damn those Irish custom agents. How dare you say that about Star Trek? You know nothing, sir. <laughs> Steve. I love you, Steve, if you're there. Oh, the other tour we just went on today in Nassau. You know when you get off the ship, your card will go bing, bing, right? If it reads properly. My first day off in Nassau, all I heard was everyone in front of me in line was like, bing, bing, okay, you're clear to go. Bing, bing, you're clear to go. I come up, he goes, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> eh, eh, eh. It's as if the equipment was saying, you are screwed. <laughs> Stay on ship. And it was just, that was the beginning of my, my Nassau experience. But the uh, excursion, we didn't do an excursion on th at this port. We got off the ship, walked over to where the taxis were, and we boarded what was like a pickup truck taxi. <laughs> it had like all these extra rows and everything. And I get on there and I'm like, oh my God, Denise Crosby. So Denise is on there, as well as Bob Picardo's wife. Bob Picardo was in a rehearsal for John Delancey's play, so he, he couldn't disembark. But his wife was there, as well as Nana, visitor's husband. Nana was in a rehearsal. So it was like a star-studded taxi truck that I was on. So I'm <laughs> sitting there. And then uh, Megan was there, Keely was there, uh, Aaron, our friend Aaron, and Belinda, and then six other fans, and they all sit on. And the two fans that sit in the front row with Denise, one of them is a huge Star Trek fan. That's Sully. Sully's a big fan, and his friend Mike, he brought along, because Sully's wife had to cancel the last second. So Mike is not as big of a fan of Trek, but he knows some things, but he saw Denise and he loves her, he loves the work that she's done before. He loves the show Suits. And Denise did a guest starring stint or recurring on Suits. So he's like, oh, I love you on Suits and the, the other projects you did and everything. And he goes, you know what? I don't know any of the other actors here. And so I'm, I'm sitting in the back. And I, I, you know, I wasn't gonna protest about myself, but I did want to say, you mean you don't know who the captain of the cruise is? <laughs> George Takei. <laughs> I didn't say that. Um, I thought that. And then as we were driving back, we met a Connecticut couple. Really cool couple, Brian and Tina. And they told us about their tour, which was the Sea World Explorer Tour. Right? They went on that in Nassau. They said, yeah, we went on the tour. We, we were at the port. We got off the ship. We boarded a boat. Then that boat took us 
to a submarine type of you know vehicle thing. We got on that, we did a little tour there. They gave us back to the boat, and instead of taking us back to port, they kind of drove that boat to an underpass of a bridge, and, and they made an announcement, which was, because it's Sunday, we got a special treat for you. We will not be taking you back to the port. We're gonna be dropping you off under this bridge. <laughs> and that's when they were thinking, something's not right here. <laughs> being dropped underneath a bridge. Don't worry, folks. There's be two vehicles, two vans to take you, take you back to the port. So these two vans roll up, and they're rickety. I mean, there's like holes in the seats. Brian and Tina are thinking, this is a white slavery thing about to happen right now. They're like, this is not. And so then I was, because I, I made that joke with them. I was like, this, yeah, you guys thought it was sketchy, right? They, yeah, we thought it was sketchy. I said, what if it was like a, a slavery ring, and they kept kidnapped you? They took you to auction and, and they bring out Brian like they're, here we have a middle-aged Caucasian man who will give me $300 for this one, $300. And then everyone's like, eh, $250, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> and now for his wife and partner. And then Tina is a redhead. So I, made, I was like, of course, she's a redhead. And everyone's like, ooh. This is the unicorn of white women, the redhead, the ginger. Everyone in Nassau, Bahamas, everyone in St. Thomas knows if you purchase a white redhead woman, you will be lucky. My mind is weird. There was a, at the, when we were doing the photo ops earlier, there's like, there's like people that are there from um, the photo company and there are people there that are Royal Caribbean staff to help with the line flow. And me being my normal chatty self, I'm talking to all the fans, and the Royal Caribbean guy's looking at me, he's like, he's like, I love your energy, it's great! You could work for Royal Caribbean! <laughs> and I just thought of myself being like a room attendant, like I'm, I'm like vacuuming, you know, on the next Star Trek cruise. <laughs> Mark, I'm telling you, Mark, that looks like Garrett Wong. I think it is. Go, go ask him. Go ask him. Sir, do you know you look like Garrett Wong? No, no. People say, yeah, I don't, I'm, just, I'm just your room attendant, you know. Your toilet is filthy. Okay. <laughs> you can work for Royal Caribbean. I go, yay. Okay. So fun. All right. Um, oh, my God. Oh, I have limited time, and I want to say this, but I don't know if I can. Dang it. Uh, uh, Alright, in Germany, um, in Germany, I'm gonna go to Germany now. In Germany, I was doing a convention, and this fan came up and said, the young lady, she says, yes, I know on Voyager, that you play the clarinet? And I said, yes, I do. Well, I have a question. I was wondering if it would be possible for you to play my clarinet. <laughs> and she literally pulled it out of her ass. And she's like, oh, she, when she walked up to the, the microphone, there was no clarinet. When she asked the question, it magically appeared. <laughs> like, like some soldiers from the Middle Ages, they have like a sword sheath. She had like a clarinet sheath on the back of her back. <laughs> so when she said that, I was on stage with Robbie McNeil, and I said, no, 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 I, I'm not gonna play the clarinet. So Robbie starts egging on the audience. And he's like, Garrett, Garrett, Garrett. And so all the audience like, Garrett. So I grab the, grab the clarinet, I pick it up, and I'm like, okay, here we go. <sighs> Just air, can't even make a sound. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. Nope, can't make a sound. Now I'm looking at McNeil, I'm like, oh, I told you I didn't want to do this. I'm like talking to him like this, I'm gonna kill you. And I'm like, nothing. I go, ladies and gentlemen, technical difficulties, I'll be right back. So I ran behind backstage, behind the curtains. I take the reed off, I wet the reed, put it back on, and whoop, I go, yes, I made the sound. So I run back out. Okay, everybody, Germany, thank you for being here. I am ready for my clarinet session. So, <laughs> again, no sound. I'm so, so, so bummed out. And I hand it back to the German girl and she's looking at me just dejected. Like her, her idol, her clarinet playing idol is false. A false God. So she's like, uh. 
And I look at Robbie and I go, dude, you just embarrassed the crap out of me. And he goes, sorry, man, I didn't know you couldn't play it. I said, I told you I didn't want to play it, right? So, so he goes, well, you know, what, I'm sorry. I mean, is there anything that would make you feel better? I said, yes, there is. <laughs> Germany, who would like to see Robbie McNeil take his shirt off? And I go, Robbie, Robbie, Robbie. And so then he's a good sport. He starts pretending he's going to, you know, he's doing this little dance move. And he, and he takes it off. He takes his shirt off. He's shirtless. He throws it up in the air. And the entire, everyone was chanting for him. And the minute he took his shirt off, Robbie had not been working out, he'd only been directing, so he kind of like let himself go. He took the shirt off, and the entire German audience was just whoosh, quiet. They're like, <gasps> And Robbie's still doing this. He's like, why isn't anyone cheering anymore? No six pack, it was a pony keg. It was like one app, one, one single app, app. And they, <laughs> they, they autograph signing the next day, the, the, the clarinet girl walks up. He's, it's very interesting. When Robbie McNeil took his shirt off, it reminded me of my father. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Vindication, yes. Revenge. Revenge. Having fun? Yeah. Yeah. Where's uh, Anthony? Is Anthony Montgomery here? Yeah. What? <laughs> Who? Mary Chifo's still there. Mary Chifo's still here. I love it. Mary, Maddie, Steven. Look, we got some cool people here. Whatever, Anthony Montgomery, whatever. Okay, all right. So let's go to the most crazy story ever that ever happened at Ensign Harry Kim or Garrett Wong. Birmingham, England. Star Trek convention. Signing autographs. One fan in a wheelchair wheels by and sees me and says, hello. And I said, hello, lady. <laughs> she was wearing a beautiful dress, gorgeous dress, one high heel because the other leg was missing. I don't know if it was a, from birth, accident, but just beautiful dress, one high heel. So she wheels away. An hour and a half later, I'm still signing autographs. She wheels back over and she comes up to the front of the line. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, it's you again, hello. She launches herself out of her wheelchair, lands on the autograph table. This is all in one move. And shimmies up to me and grabs the sh shirt collar and pulls my shirt towards her. And she says, I like your shirt. <laughs> now, when she said that, I could smell five or six types of alcohol on her breath. I just being bathed, bathed in alcohol, just all over me. I'm like, oh. I said, thank you. I'm glad you like my shirt. Then the next thing that she said, this is what really got me. She's holding on to my shirt and she says, will you be my after dinner mint? <laughs> I just want to tell you, I've done a lot of conventions. No one has ever launched out of a wheelchair, shimmied up, grabbed me, breathed a bunch of alcohol on me, and said, will you be my after dinner mint? <laughs> At which point I responded, I'm so sorry, I'm in a relationship. And at that point, when she realized that I was not on the menu, um, she released my shirt and her right hand went back like this. Yes. At this point, Everything was super slow motion. Cause she was like, she went from lust to anger, like yeah! fueled by alcohol. All the handlers and the assistants for the convention, they're like, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> and me too, no. <laughs> As I saw that hand coming towards me, slow motion, I go, oh my God. And people are asking, why didn't you duck? Why didn't you run away? I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm just too shocked. She asked me to be her after dinner mint, you know, and all this crap. And I'm, I'm looking at that hand going, there's no way that this fan is going to slap me. <sighs> way. <laughs> when she connected, it was with the force of a gale force hurricane. It was like a hurricane that hit me. 
she hit me so hard, I flew out of my chair, my signing chair. I'm on the ground, I got back up, dazed and confused, sat back down. Everyone around me was still like in mid of, no! Like they were frozen in time, no! My face is stinging, she gets back in her wheelchair, gives me a look, and wheels off. <laughs> No one stopped her, they just let her go. Like, what are you gonna do, tackle the wheelchair woman? Like, tackle the wheelchair woman, take her out. No, no. I'm gonna guarantee you, no other actor has experienced this at a convention, it's just me. Yeah. That was a slap that was heard around the world. So me being funny, I said, you know what? I need to make a t-shirt. I like making t-shirts, you know, fan of cool t-shirts. I said, I want it to be like an Altoid box, you know, looking like an Altoid mint box. And it's gonna be Harry's mints, right? Harry's after dinner mints. <laughs> I said this at a convention, and the fan, co the fan comes up to my table later and says, I got the slogan for your box of mints there. I go, what? And she's like, Harry's after dinner mints. So refreshing, it's like a slap in the face. <laughs> So my goal is to make those shirts and have them for sale on the cruise next year. So you can... Oh my god. Oh. I got like a minute now. What can I say in a minute? I know. Something funny. Say, oh, when we, got, when we got off the cruise ship at St. Thomas, you know there's those people on the stilts right there, right? And the, and the people that you're taking pictures with. And there's a guy in a little shack, like an announcer with a, with a, with a companion or an assistant. And he's like, welcome to St. Thomas. Feel free to take pictures with our performers, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm standing next to the shack waiting for some other friends to come out. And... The guy stops talking on the microphone, puts it down, and I hear him talking to the girl next to him. And she says something like, what is happening? She's looking at everyone with Star Trek stuff on and everything. She's like, what's going on? And the guy goes, oh yeah, they're all from Star Trek. And she's like, no. <laughs> like, I think she thought that he was saying, these are all actors from Star Trek. Like, every single Star Trek show and movie, every actor and background actor, thousands of them, they're all here on this one ship. Get them off right now. It's unbelievable. <laughs> what? Yeah, all right, cool, thank you. I gotta be careful of encouraging people in the audience because I did that in one show. I encouraged one person and Denise Crosby had to get up and handle it, if you guys were at that show. She became Tasha Yar. She's like, Garrett, you want me to handle this? I go, yeah, go right ahead. And she walked over and she goes, I'm gonna give you one freaking warning. What? And then you're out, you know. And then Tasha Yar did her thing. I love that. Good old Tasha. Um, you know, there was a, uh, <laughs> there was a time that I moderated a uh, panel with Carrie Elwes. Carrie Elwes from Princess Bride. Uh, so I'm sitting there talking and someone goes like, um, would you, would you be part of Princess Bride, uh, Princess Bride, the, uh, Broadway musical? And he's like, oh, no, no, no. You know, I'm far too old to reprise that role of Wesley. I can't, I, I can't do it. And um, they were like, no, no, we love you. He goes, well, let me tell you a story about when I was a child in England. And I'm sitting there listening to him. And he said that when he was a kid, Selfridges, it's a department store in England, Selfridges had invited a special guest to come talk to the kids, the local kids. And it was Adam West, the original Batman. The original Batman, Adam West. So yeah, someone's doing the na 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 okay. <laughs> So they've got curtains, they open it up, and they've rigged up this like this pulley system where Adam West was like on a hook and he, in a harness, and he comes in and lands on stage, and he's wearing the entire costume that he had, the Lycra costume, and he's in that. And at this point in Adam's life, he's had one too many cupcakes, and uh, he's just, he's, every part of that suit's just, it's about to break free, okay? Um, so he's out of shape. So he lands down on there, 
and he looks out at the audience of kids, British kids. He's like, uh, hey, kids. Uh, uh, and he passes out because the suit's so tight on him. <laughs> the announcer's like, lower the curtain, lower the curtain. So they lower the curtain, but his bat boots are still sticking out from the other side of the curtain. So then the kid in the front row goes, Batman's dead! Batman's dead! And then all the kids start crying and screaming. He told this story, I fell off my chair. Just like being slapped by a fan, I fell off because this was the funniest story I heard from another actor in my entire life. And it was wonderful. None of you are going to get that image out of your head. Batman's boots sticking out. <laughs> you can imagine that. You're a little kid. <laughs> Welcome to Selfridges. Today we have a very special treat for all of you and kids. We have Adam West all the way from America. Here he is. <laughs> Hello, kids. <laughs> Two boots. <laughs> Two boots. <laughs> Wizard of Oz. <laughs> oh my goodness. I think that's it. I'm running. I know. Isn't that crazy? There's like 30 more things on this paper right now, but I got. <laughs> We've got time. We've got time. Should I tell one more story? I tell one more story. All right. Um, <laughs> so we, uh, we had a cruise, not Star Trek the Cruise. There was another co company called Cruise Trek has been doing cruises for many years. Some of you may have been on it, yeah. So we were actually cruising from Puerto Rico, and we had a flight to San Juan, Puerto Rico, and we had a couple days early. I got there a couple days early. I hung out with uh, Marnie Delancey, John Delancey's wife. John hadn't come in yet. A young Keegan, a young Owen Delancey. They were kids. I remember I was out on the beach building sandcastles with the Delancey boys. Really fun. Then we get on the cruise, and... Um, um, oh, sorry, I, I got the strong story right. Before we got on the cruise, they had a excursion for the actors to go on. The excursion was to go to Arecibo, the, yes, uh, the observatory over there for uh, search for extraterrestrial life, the SETI project. So we're, we're supposed to go to Arecibo. So we all go to Arecibo and I get there and I'm, I'm so parched. I just want to drink. I didn't bring a bottle of water. And they go, oh, there's a water fountain right there. I go to it. Nothing comes out. I'm like, is there anywhere else that I can get a drink? They go, oh, there's a there's a Coke machine on the, on the bottom level. So I leave the VIP tour to go to the Coke machine. And I stick, I have no change. I stick a dollar bill into the dollar slot and it goes in and it stops halfway. I'm like, oh, man. So I start pulling and pulling to get it back out. Now it tears in two. So now the other torn half that's still in the machine is stuck there. I can't put another dollar in. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. I can't get anything. So then I find somebody else, an employee walking by. I go, hey, 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 is there any place other than the Coke machine? They're like, oh, there's an employee, ca there's a cafeteria around the corner. I go, great. I go in the cafeteria. I grab a bottle of water and something else. I go to the counter and the lady goes, employee ID? And I said, oh, no, I'm on a tour. Um, I can, there's a Coke machine around the corner, sir. I, go, I know, <laughs> there's a Coke machine. My bill got to end. And when I'm kind of arguing with her, this one employee gets up and he, come, he leaves his lunch and he storms over to me. And everyone in this lunchroom is Puerto Rican except for this one guy who's a six foot four, lanky, Caucasian blonde guy from Minnesota. Okay, so he comes over and he's like, didn't you hear what she said? This is for employees only. And he's yelling at me. I'm like, what the, I'm like, what are you doing? And so we get into this whole argument back and forth, and guess what? We end up being sent, being sent to the, uh, the observatory director's office. So we were sent to the principal's office, basically. And we're sitting there, and this guy's name is Bob. So Bob is sitting there, he's still like, his veins are still pumping, he's so angry. He's sitting in one chair, and he's just getting hot under the collar, and he's telling the director, this guy thinks he, and the director, please. And he's a really calm, he was like the ASMR of Puerto Ricans. It was like, he was so calm, his voice. He's like, please, Bob, we don't need to have any drama here. And then I'm like, well, you know what? Bob was a jerk. I'm sitting here on a VIP tour and he kept yells at me, Mr. Wong, 
please, no drama, okay. <laughs> so I'm calming down. But it going back and forth. And the, the pace with which this director was speaking was so slow that it took forever to get out any information. And I knew that that tour was leaving at some point, right? So we're there for, I don't know, half an hour. And finally, the director's phone rings. And he picks it up. He's like, hola, si, 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 oh, si, si. Bueno, hangs up. Well, Mr. Wong, evidently your tour group has left. <laughs> so, Roxanne Dawson, Tim Russ, like of all the, everyone else on this tour, they're gone, all right? They're gone to the next stop. They're going to the, the Bat Caves, the Guano Caves or whatever. And I'm sitting here going, oh my God, what am I gonna do? Like I'm screwed. And then I look at the director, I said, What's, what, what should I do? He was like, well, Bob? You must drive, Mr. Wong, <laughs> to the next location. And hopefully, by the time you reach that location, in one hour, you will be friends. <laughs> Bob looks at me like the look of death, like, I mean, I can see his mind, he's like, can I kill him and throw him out the car in that one hour time, maybe? Can I hide that body? I mean, he, he was not happy. I wasn't happy. We're sitting in the car, and I'm just, my arms are folded, and I'm just like, damn, Bob. I hate you. You're the worst astronomer ever. <laughs> no customer service. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, and he's quiet. He's angry. He's gripping the steering wheel. And then finally, like half an hour into the ride, he says something. He, he's calm enough to go like, <clears throat> So you're on a VIP tour, huh? And I was like, yeah, I was. What group are you with? I said, Star Trek. And he's like, he's like, what? <laughs> Star Trek? You mean, you're fans of Star No, we're all actors on Star Trek. What? <laughs> Which one? Voyager. What? What character? Harry Kim. What? <laughs> you were Ensign Kim? I go, yeah. He's like, oh my god. Like he, did, he had no clue. I had sunglasses on the whole time. Like when I was arguing with him up in the director's office in his car, I took my sunglasses off and he flipped out. And all of a sudden he went from angry Bob to, you know, Bob my bestie. And it was amazing. He was like, he stopped at the location where everyone else was. He goes, okay, next time you're in Puerto Rico, you're not staying at a hotel. You're staying at Bob's. <laughs> Here's my address. Email. My friend's address. <laughs> um, but so that was the end of that one. And it was, you know, it was a nice ending, right? That's, these are the perks that Star Trek gives you, so. <laughs> All right. I've gone over my time, but I want to thank everyone for coming out to my stand-up show. And, oh, I have one last thing to say. Sorry, one very fun last thing to show. This is the, I totally forgot about this. The name of my show last year was Forever Ensign. The name of my show this year is You Have Two Working Feet. So people are like, what the heck? What happened was Joey from ECP sent me an email saying, Garrett, we need the name for your new show to put in the program. And right before that, five, five minutes before that email came in, I was at home with Megan. Megan had just come back from the kitchen, and as all spouses do, their timing is horrible. I asked her to grab me something from the kitchen where she had just come from. And she looks at me, she's like, you have two working feet. And that's the name of the show. Thank you, everybody.